here's where we are in our locomotion journey. We've talked about basic gait terminology, force measurements, energetics of walking, and simple models of walking. And now we're going to talk about how walking and running differ. And the key difference is we get much more elastic storage of energy in running. The forces are higher, so using this spring mass model for running is, is key. So that's where we're headed next. So how is walking different from running? Well, we saw in walking, there's always at least one foot on the ground. As you walk faster and faster, that period where both feet are on the ground shrinks until you get to a certain speed where you take flight. And that's where running begins. So that's a key difference. Walking, always one foot on the ground. Running, there's a flight phase. But there are other key differences between walking and running. We saw that there's this beautiful trade-off between gravitational potential energy and forward speed in walking, and that doesn't exist in running. In running, we'll see we use a totally different mechanism. The dynamics are different, and this spring-loaded running is a key concept. So they're kinematically different in the sense that one foot's always on the ground in walking and not running, but they're also dynamically quite different. And there's some in-between gates as well that we might adopt when we're trying to walk very fast, where dynamically it looks a lot like running, but you still have one foot on the ground. Like walking, running is cyclic, and we define a running gait cycle here. The parameters are a little bit different. So unlike walking, the stance phase is shorter than the swing phase, so that we have a, a flight phase. So there's uh, a time when neither, the, neither foot is in contact that's called the, the flight phase. So at 0% of the running gait cycle, again, similar to walking, there's foot contact, and that repeats over here at 100% of the gait cycle. We also have a toe-off phase when the foot leaves the ground. There's peak knee flexion, you see it's much higher than it is during walking, and that occurs about the middle of the, the flight phase. So there is a support phase or stance phase and a flight phase for each leg, about 15%. And that varies, of course, with speed. The faster you go, the shorter the, the stance phase. Another big difference is the ground reaction forces. You saw that during walking, the ground reaction forces were about one body weight as you stand on one leg. In running, you're also standing on one leg, but you're doing that for a shorter period of time. So what I'm plotting here is the ground reaction force in the vertical direction and the horizontal direction versus the percentage of gait cycle. I've superimposed the walking ground reaction force here, and what you see is in running, it's much higher it can reach easily three body weights, whereas in walking it's just one body weight. So the forces in running are much higher. Similar to walking, in the horizontal phase, there's a horizontal ground reaction force that is directed towards the back of the body, so we call that negative, early in stance, and then later in stance, there's a positive direction, propelling you forward. Superimposed here is also the ground reaction force during walking, you see it's smaller in both the horizontal and vertical directions. Now the kinetic and potential energy are also quite different in running. What you see is that they are in phase in running. So what I'm plotting in the blue is the kinetic energy, and you see that it is peak at the same time that gravitational potential energy is peak. It's pretty easy to understand this conceptually. In running, there's this flight phase. In flight, that is when your mass center is highest. That's also when you've just finished pushing off against the ground, so your velocity is its highest. So the kinetic energy, one half mv squared, is highest during flight, and that's when your mass center is high highest, so the same potential energy. You notice in the plot that the forward kinetic energy is flat. So it goes up and then it's flat. 
That's because once you leave the ground, assuming no wind resistance, your velocity is constant. There's no forces acting on your body that are external, so your, your acceleration is zero, so your speed is constant during the flight phase. Of course, that ignores, ignores uh, wind resistance, which typically can be quite small. So unlike walking, we don't benefit from this beautiful trade-off of gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. They're in phase. And these are real measurements of energy. So what I'm plotting here is energy versus percentage of gait cycle for right leg stance and left leg stance. And you see gravitational potential energy shown in the red here peaks at the same time as the forward kinetic energy. And so they are in phase. They're also low at the same time. So what does that mean? Is running just very inefficient? No, running is actually quite efficient. We just use a different mechanism. During the stance phase, muscles and tendons store elastic energy. So it's stored and then released as we push into the flight phase. And that gives rise to this simple model of running. So what we see here is just a depiction of a human running. The mass center at foot contact is high. During the stance phase, the mass center lowers, and then the mass center increases in height. Much like you'd see in an oscillating spring that starts high here. During the stance phase, it compresses a little bit, storing energy. And at the end of the stance phase, there's a liberation of that energy that propels you forward and upward into the flight phase. Now, I mentioned at the outset that human running is much like hopping. We're hopping on one leg, but kangaroos hop on two legs and they're excellent hoppers. So to understand running and the elastic storage of energy during running, it's useful to look at kangaroos' gait. They're famous for hopping, but at low speeds, they have a gait called pentapedal gait. And you can see it here, the two forelimbs, the two hindlimbs, and the tail, so five points of contact, are on the ground. At about six to seven kilometers per hour, they transition to hopping. So you can see the pentapedal gait here, and then the transition to hopping at about six to seven kilometers per hour. Now, cruising speed for hopping is up to 20 kilometers per hour, so quite rapid. It's interesting, these animations came from a beautiful CD by Neil Alexander, who is a fantastic biomechanist who studied elastic mechanisms in animal locomotion. And you could almost see this spring mass model as you look at the, the kangaroo hopping. So let's analyze the kangaroo gait energetics in a little bit more detail. So what I'm plotting here is the, on the top plot, the stride length, and on the bottom plot, the stride frequency. And I'm plotting those versus the speed of hopping in kilometers per hour. What you see in this shaded region is pentapedal gait down here at low speeds, and the stride length during pentapedal gait increases with speed. Once you transition to hopping, the stride frequency is relatively constant. So why is that? Why is stride frequency constant? We can think of a, a different mechanical model for running and for a kangaroo hopping than we had for walking. In kangaroo hopping, you can think about a mass sitting on top of a spring. Now this mass is going to oscillate, and it will oscillate at a certain natural frequency. So the frequency will be equal to the square root of the K over M. That is the stiffness of the spring divided by the mass. So the reason that we see this relatively constant frequency is that the kangaroos are bouncing at the natural frequency. So they will keep that bouncing resonant frequency. And I can keep this resonant frequency too. I don't have to put much energy in to keep bouncing like this. So even though kangaroos are increasing their hopping speed, they're keeping that hopping frequency relatively constant. 
Well, the speed of the kangaroo hopping is going to be their hop frequency, which is relatively constant, times their hop length. So the only way to increase speed is shown here. Here's the stride length. So at increasing speed, the kangaroo puts in a little bit more energy to their hop. So they're hopping at the same frequency, but now they can inject a little bit more energy from the muscles and increase the hop length. And that's how they increase their hopping speed. So we also take advantage of natural frequencies in running. We bounce on a single leg when we run uh, that is close to our natural frequency. So how do kangaroos choose whether they're going to use their pentobetal gait or hop? And why do humans choose to walk versus run? There are a few reasons, a few driving factors, but a key one is energetics. And you can see that in this curve here. What I'm plotting for kangaroo gait transition is now I'm plotting oxygen consumption versus speed. So oxygen consumption is measured in liters of oxygen per kilogram per hour. So how much energy are you spending? And you can, you can measure this in using a gas mask in your inspired air and expired air. So you can imagine this experiment was quite difficult to do. So they had kangaroos with gas masks on hopping on a treadmill at various speeds controlled by the experimenter. And what's plotted here is at these slow speeds, they used very little energy per time. And as they increased speed in pen to pedal gait, they used more and more energy. Now, when they transition to hopping, you see they're going faster and using less energy. So this is an amazing thing. So the, the kangaroos are moving faster and they're getting more miles per gallon. So they're using less energy per time, less energy per distance. That's what drives the gait transition. We are driven to preserve energy. We take energy in as food, we expend it in activity, and minimizing the energetic cost is a key principle that many animals use in locomotion. And we can see it very clearly in the kangaroos here. So how do we go about measuring the energetic cost of locomotion? I've shown you just a quick setup from my lab here. Rachel uh, Jackson's making measurements of uh, energy cost as my daughter Stella runs on the treadmill. And we can get the energetic cost by measuring uh, how much oxygen people are consuming with the gas mask. So we measure the uh, content of the air being breathed in and the content of the air being expired out. And that difference will give us the amount of oxygen we're burning. And that's a good measure of how much fuel we're burning, how many calories, how many calories per hour or how many calories per distance. So the calories per hour is the metabolic rate. The calories per distance, we call that the cost of locomotion. How many gallons per mile it takes to uh, run your, your locomotor apparatus. One of the key principles in human locomotion is that we walk at a speed that minimizes our cost of locomotion. So what I'm showing here now is cost of transport. So before, with the kangaroos, I was showing you the cost per time. Here I'm showing you cost per distance. So here it's plotted in joules per kilogram meter. So it's how much energy you're burning per kilogram, big people burn more energy, per distance traveled. And I'm plotting that versus walking speed. So here's the cost of transport versus walking speed. And here's various experimental studies dating back to the, the 1950s. And you see for all of them, there's a minimum that's a little bit above one, about 1 1.2, 1.3 meters per second. Of course, this depends on how tall you are and other factors, but lo and behold, that's the speed we choose to walk. We walk at a speed that minimizes our energy expended per distance traveled. 
This is a fundamental and useful principle related to human locomotion and locomotion of many animals. We'll see later on in the class that we use this principle about what's being optimized, that energy cost is being minimized to derive computational models of the nervous system when we predict how our brain and spinal cord are coordinating and controlling movement. So just some key points to summarize from this lecture is that running is a cyclic activity, much like walking, but in running we have a flight phase. The kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy are in phase during running in contrast to walking. Nonetheless, running is efficient due to elastic storage of energy in muscle and tendon. We store energy during the stance phase, release it as we push into the flight phase, and that's how human runners are so efficient. It turns out that pr same principle holds true in many animals. We saw that for the kangaroo here, but it holds true for other animals as well. See you next time.